My name is William Uricchio. I'm a professor of computer media studies at MIT in the U.S. And there I run a lab called the uh, Open Documentary Lab, where we look at new technologies, emerging technologies, and the mission of documentary coming together, trying to figure out what that means for how we, how we represent the world. The relationship between cinema and virtual reality is a complex one. And it's complex because cinema really is a, a major repository of a lot of our, our, our visual storytelling traditions. I mean, of course, we have art history, we have photography, but cinema has been, with moving image, actually the, the locus classicus of, of how, we, how we express ourselves. And so, so naturally, there's a developed tradition there. There's a lot of skilled people there. And they're always looking for ways to maybe expand their, their abilities. One person makes an excellent case for the connection between VR and cinema, and that person is, is no one other than André Bazin, the French uh, critic and theorist in the, in the 40s and 50s, the, one of the editors of Cahiers de Cinéma, one of the, the teachers of Godard and Truffaut, a really insightful man. And for, for Bazin, there was a notion of what he calls the myth of total cinema, where cinema is not about nitrate or acetate. It's not about 16 millimeter or 70 millimeter. It's not about 3D or 2D. It's really about a mission, a quest, a vision, a, a way of constructing a world and letting us enter that world visually. And for Bazin, something like virtual reality probably might have been understood as cinema. It's just the next technology that's coming along. Personally, I think that there are three good reasons to question the relationship, to challenge the relationship between cinema and VR. And those really rest on the idea of the frame, that little frame that is so important in film, the idea of a point of view, which cinema really constructs, and editors together with uh, the, the cinematographers um, construct those. And third is a particular kind of story that I think um, film is very good with, and a very different kind of story that I think VR is, is good with. So the frame is, is a key part of Western culture pretty much from the mid-15th century onwards. Uh, Alberti and Brunelleschi and a lot of the Italian theorists of perspective always worked with a framed space. And, um, and that's a little bit different from some of the church decor that we see before, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages. Absolutely different from what you find in Luxor, in some of the, the Egyptian uh, grave sites. Very different from what you find in, in prehistoric caves, where you have whole environments. What the mid-15th century brought us was a very carefully defined space, a space that separated uh, the, a piece of the world from everything else, a thing where composition and color balance and all those issues started to really become um, developed. And from that time to this, from, from the work of Alberti and Brunelleschi up through painters and the coming of photography and then film, uh, that frame has been determining. That is really, you know, in, in, in film studies we spend an awful lot of time thinking about composition, on-screen space, off-screen space, how those edges are defined. A second really crucial issue to me is point of view. That's closely related to the frame because the frame directs what we see, confines us to what's in the little box. Um, and point of view sets up a relationship between us, we, the subject, and the object that we're looking at. And that in film is, is really a crucial part of the emotional vocabulary. Whose point of view I have, who I empathize with, what I see that other characters perhaps don't see. My role in a cinema, in a, in a cinematic narrative, is absolutely hangs upon things like point of view and, the, and, of course, composition. So those are two elements that virtual reality simply lacks. Virtual reality is frameless. Its power is that there's something next to me, behind me, above me, uh, wherever I look, there's a world, much as the world I inhabit. So where the task of a director is to direct, direct my vision, direct my attention, in VR, I'm not directed, I'm self-selective, self I can look wherever I want. Same with point of view, where the director and the editor work in concert to define my point of view in virtual reality, I'm, I can do what I want. I can wander where I want to wander, look where I want to look. The very projects, the very tool set that make these two media what they are, are 
antithetical. I mean, they're just at opposite ends of the spectrum. The third thing I think is pretty relevant here is story form. I think our default notion of story really goes back to the book, a fixed story. Not to say a fixed chronological order, that can always change, but whatever the sequence of events is, is fixed. And whatever version, if I read the paperback version, the cheap version, the expensive version, it's always pretty much the same. Uh, if I watch a film, and I know the museum, does, uh, the Eye Institute does a lot to try to get films back to their original state, there is a proper sequence. And that sequence is something that directors work very hard to establish. VR enables, I would argue, a very different kind of narrative. Less a fixed and authored narrative, like a book or a movie, and more an experiential narrative. VR provides a space where we can find stories. We, the user, can find stories. Yes, they've been planted by an author. They've been structured by an author who builds that environment. But our job is to actually seek, find, be curious, uh, and put together a story on our terms. This is also a story. It doesn't get talked about much as a story because it doesn't line up with the world of literary theory. It's not like the way a book works. But Carlo Ginsberg, a really wonderful theorist, talks about hunting as really the origins of story. A hunter walks through the world and sees a footprint, a bit of fur on a branch, a broken twig. And from that is able to assemble a story about the kind of animal that came this way, and when they came, and where they're going, and where they're going to find them. And that's really a kind of a story. And I think one way to put it in terms that, that, that you know, I think everyone has experienced is um, if you visit a city, you can always take you know, a tour bus. You can pay f whatever, 10 euros, and you can get on a bus, and you can have a ride through the city where a knowledgeable guide tells you everything you need to know. It's a linear experience. It's a scripted experience. It's a wonderful experience. You see a lot. You learn a lot. You get a good overview. But that's a very different experience from the kind of story that comes from wandering in a city from just following your nose, from stopping in a shop, from having a coffee, from looking at the street signs or the roof lines or whatever you want to do. And everyone who wanders in a city has a very different experience from one another as opposed to all the people on the bus who have exactly the same experience. Maybe different interpretations, but largely the same experience. So I think what VR brings to the table is that, also video games, that notion of an experience-based narrative where we, the, the customer, we, the user, have to actually find the bits of a story and put them together in a way that's pleasurable for us or makes sense to us. And that's something that film doesn't do. Film is really about a carefully crafted and scripted and, you know, to the, to the, to the nth detail worked out the shots, the cutting rhythms, the timing, everything is perfectly done to tell the story the director wants to tell. In VR, it's a world that we can wander in, we can explore, we can do what we want with. And some of us will find a good story, some of us will be lazy and maybe have a poor story, whatever, but that's a very different kettle of fish. So I think those three things together, the frame, the point of view, and the story, are the three building blocks of cinema that are completely absent in the case of VR. And it's why I think there's a pretty good argument to be made to say, actually, we should look elsewhere for our precedents, not so much to cinema, but rather to things like games or immersive theaters or maybe theme park design, maybe magic for all, you know, it could be a lot of things, but it's probably not the carefully crafted and directed gaze that cinema has. But there's fast emerging a third story form uh, that you might call the algorithmic story. So these are stories where there's a lot of preloaded data, but what of that data we see is actually based on what algorithms think we want to see. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different versions of this. In some cases, algorithms just write the stories for newspapers for everyone. But increasingly, there are systems that whether they're using tracking uh, EEG, whether they're tracking our brain waves, or tracking where we look, or tracking our biomarkers like heartbeat, or, or, or galvanic, uh, galvanic uh, skin response, or our breathing rate, all these can be, or even our facial set, all these can be markers of interest, or of, uh, of fear, or engagement. 
And the story can be constructed simply by the algorithms, the systems reading us and saying, oh, you're interested in this, we're going to give you more of this. Or you don't like that, we're not going to give you that anymore. The, 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 and so in that way, these new stories, some of these new stories are kind of constructed by partly reading us. I like to use the example of uh, Alice, in, Alice in, in the Looking Glass, uh, Alice in Wonderland, where she's looking in the looking glass and enters that other world. It's a reflection of her world, but with some twists. It's not a perfect re reflection of her world. In fact, it's some very dark twists. And that's a little bit the way these systems work. If you think of how Facebook figures out how to curate all the things your friends are saying, but you're only seeing a little bit of it. Why is that chosen for you? And why is it chosen for you now? Or if you use Amazon's uh, book recommendations, uh, at least in my case, they're very, they're very accurate. Like, how does it know really that I read this or want to read this? So those kinds of systems can also be used to tell stories, to make choices from among the, the options in a story environment and present those to us. And that's very tricky because it, the more of us it involves, the more satisfying, the more seductive, the more, the more maybe I want to dive deeper and deeper into this world. Um, it's emerging. I don't think we. I, I think we have to be very careful about it. It's, I'm sure it has. Uh, I'm not sure. I know it has a lot of ethical, uh, uh, there, a lot of potentials for misuse and a lot of ethical implications in the video world and film world. It's just starting to happen. The very first steps are being made, but these technologies move quickly, and sooner rather than later this will be coming our way. So this is a story form I'm, I'm really watching very carefully and thinking about the ways in which artificial intelligence and the, the project of storytelling come together.